What is going on? My name is Psyche, and welcome back to another Dead Cells video. This time around, I will be featuring another item from the Fatal Falls DLC, and that is the Ferryman's Lantern. So I know I've been trying to feature the Snake Fangs for a while, but for some reason, I just wasn't getting it in my runs, so... In the meantime, I'll do some showcase runs for other items from the DLC, so... This time around, it will be the Lantern. Now just a bit of heads up, I mainly post content about Dead Cells, both guides as well as 5BC runs, just like this one, so if any of that is interesting to you, make sure to subscribe to the channel. It takes up no time and it really helps me out, and if you ever change your mind later, you can always just unsubscribe. So without further ado, let's get into the run. A bit of warning though, this run is a spliced run, meaning that not all footage that you will see in this video is from the same run. The reason for this is because I forgot to hit the record button when I was entering the corrupted prison all the way to the end of the first fight with Concierge. However, I do have footage of these same biomes from a separate run with also the Ferryman's Lantern. So I will be using that portion of that run to fill in the missing parts for this run. However, in that last run, I did die in the Slumbering Sanctuary. Rest assured that I went to exactly the same biomes and exactly the same routes using the exact same equipment. So unfortunately, not every single bit you see in this video is from the same run, but other than that, most of it is, so keep that in mind. And here we get the Ferryman's Lantern. Now, actually, this is the lantern that I will be using for the rest of this run, which is a pretty long time, but you know. And in case you're wondering, I do all of my runs in normal mode because I think that's how the way Death Cells is supposed to be experienced. It's all about adaptation. It's all about finding things that work well and don't work well. So you can decide for yourself how to progress with your run, and that's exactly what I intend to do with my 5BC gameplay runs. So what I found out about the Ferryman's Lantern is that this is the first item in the game, the first two-handed item in the game that dual scales with brutality and tactics. Now in the past, every single two-handed weapon in the game scales with survival, so if you think back to the Scythe Claws, every single crossbow in the game all of them scales with survival as well. So the lantern is kind of an oddball item in this game right now because it's kind of weird how it works. So the gimmick about the lantern is that you can hit things with a melee attack up to three times in a combo. And that's what the first button does where you just swing around with the lantern. The second button though is where you can unleash the souls that you have gathered from killing enemies with the lantern's melee attack. And if you unleash three or more souls at the same time, then it inflicts critical damage. Now good news, the critical damage is massive. Like it absolutely demolishes every single enemy if you can manage to do a critical hit with the flying souls. However, the flip side is that the melee damage isn't very good and you have to use it in order to gather souls in order to charge up the lantern. Now, a major thing that people complain about when this was just announced is that, well, how is this going to work in bosses? Well, actually, the third hit in the in the Lantern's combo steals one soul if you hit a boss with it. So it's kind of a problem, though, because that means you're going to have to hit bosses consecutively with a with the Lantern's attack, which already doesn't do a lot of damage, and you have to commit to the whole thing in order to benefit from the souls that you gather from it. And here, just starting here, is where the spliced run begins. So this portion of the run is from a separate run where I also use the lantern. However, like I said before, in this run, I did die in the Slumbering Sanctuary. But in both runs, I went to Ramparts and fought the Concierge. I did manage to get through this part in the run that I, that I actually managed to upload. However, just know that this is a separate run and not the original that I started out with. So one thing that I found out is really helpful is that the lantern, you can actually take the ammo mutation, which doubles ammunition for your weapons. However, the souls actually count towards the ammo count. So, so the ammo mutation actually is very, very helpful if you're running the Ferryman's Lantern. 
Now, I went to the Concierge because if I'm going to be trying to get souls from bosses, that means I have to be able to keep the combo going until I can land the third hit. Otherwise, if I'm moving all over the place, I will never gather souls from bosses. So this makes me think that the Ferryman's Lantern is not suited for the Conjunctivious fight, and maybe I would do the Mama Tick fight, though it is a bit trickier as well. And here I'm just trying to showcase how much damage it's able to do on the Souls attack. I'll, I'll just call it the Souls attack for now. And here I open up a challenge rift. Now a note is that I actually opened up a total of four challenge rifts in this alternate run. But in the run that I had in the beginning, I only entered like one of them. So I've got a lot of comments saying how I miss challenge rifts. And yeah, sometimes I do miss them, but that's because, you know, I'm usually really concentrated on what's happening at the screen at all times that I just kind of forget they exist. And there, as you can see, the Toxic Miasma just died by the Lantern attack, the Souls attack, and it just does so much damage. The only trade-off is that you do have to work in order to pull off that Soul attack. Now, in the Challenge Rift, I'm going to speed up the footage, but I'm going to show the entire process of me actually clearing the Challenge Rift, because I think it's pretty entertaining, honestly. Something to note is that the thumbnail that I use is the second version of what I made. So when I initially wanted to design the thumbnail for this video, I wanted to use that guy from the meme where he says like, can I offer you an egg in these trying times? Which is from the show It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. But instead of holding the egg, he would be holding the lantern. So I believe I'll have a prototype of the thumbnail that I was using before. So this was the thumbnail that was supposed to be used for this video, but but then after I looked at it, I just thought the colors looked really, really bland and it didn't really fit with the context. So then I changed it to Gilgamesh from Fate Stay Night because the Lantern Souls attack kind of reminded me of like the swords flying out from different dimensions. I forgot what those things were called in the anime, so it's been a while since I watched it. And I thought it was pretty good, though. The Lantern just reminded me of his like power and that's how I used it for this thumbnail. So moving forwards to the ramparts, the only reason I went to ramparts is because there was no other suitable option. If I went to the toxic sewers, then I would have to fight Conjunctivious, which like I said before, if I'm just trying to like predict what's going to happen, if I fought Conjunctivious, then I thought it's probably not going to work out. Conjunctivious is just flying all, all over the place, there is no way I can get in the third hit, which gives me more souls. You're getting hit by that Rampager a lot. So I believe Rampagers are introduced in 3 boss cells and above, and it's mainly what's gatekeeping players from reaching 4 BC. Because Rampagers are very scary when you first encounter them. If you get hit by the onslaught of attacks from a Rampager, you can essentially lose out your entire health bar, which is extremely detrimental. So one thing about Rampagers is that you just have to like roll into his attack and you cannot roll away from it. If you roll away from it, you will get caught in the cluster of attacks. So here I find yet another challenge rift, and it's because I left an amulet with extra jump somewhere on the map that I'm able to retrieve it and then go back into the challenge rift. Because the amulet that I'm using right now does not contain an extra jump. So sometimes if you see an amulet with extra jumps somewhere on the map, but it doesn't align with the color, you can always just keep it there in case you find a challenge rift so you can just use it to clear the challenge rift and then come back and then just recycle it. Like I said in the last video, I think Ramparts is also one of those biomes that you should just try to avoid because there aren't that many enemies here, so it's very hard. I would say it's considerably harder to fill the 60 kill streak requirement for the door, for the 60 kill door. I know it is like the default choice for beginner players since they're, they can't really access the other biomes and yeah, I mean, if it's like, if you have no other choice then yeah, sure, you can go to the ramparts, but overall I would try to go for other biomes. 
Now something to know about ramparts, on 3BC and above, you get a boss cell door that also leads you to Conjunctivius. So if you're on 3BC and above, not only does ramparts lead to the Concierge, it also leads to Conjunctivius, which is an option that's not available to newer players. So here you'll see just how much damage the orbs are able to do to the concierge. And I'm just trying to store up as many souls as possible before his attacks become fast and it looks like it's not even needed because the concierge is just dead. Now unfortunately, I did get hit in this fight, so I did not yet the no-hit doors. And now to the Slumbering Sanctuary. So this is now the original run that I started out in the beginning. If you're wondering how I died in the last run, is that I died to an elite ability with the crystal projectiles while I was cursed. So maybe I'll show the footage on the screen somewhere, just so you know how my other run ended. So it, it wasn't pretty. Because I knew the elite ability was coming, it's just that I didn't know where it was from, so unfortunately I lost the run. I died to the curse. And I'm just trying to showcase as much as as much of the ability as possible, the souls ability, because it just does so much damage and it's very satisfying when you can actually pull it off. So as you can see, most burst attacks from the flying souls will one-shot elites. So that is very good. And on top of that, I find that the damage you do with the melee attack isn't actually that bad. Though, as you will see later on, the melee attacks becomes less reliable the later you go in your runs. So in my alternate run footage, you'll see that I actually took an off-color armadillo pack with a Rampart's shield. The reason for this is that I think in the backpack update, in the 2.1 update, where they also revamped the melee system, they did a really good job designing the reworking the backpacks, something that two-handed weapons severely lacked before the update was defense capabilities. You're committing both your primary slots to a single weapon, which means you cannot use a shield. However, it all changed with the backpack update where you can now store a shield in your backpack and now you can run armadillo pack, which uses the shield whenever you roll. So this is helpful in a variety of reasons. So something like the Scythe Claws is very, very powerful. However, because there weren't any defense capabilities, that's where it primarily suffered from. And you'll see here just dodging the golems, using the souls attack to kill them, as well as the aliens. I know the aliens are pretty tricky to deal with. That's why I just try to use the flamethrower turret to clear them out. I'm still doing well, and I've already cleared the curse in the Slumbering Sanctuary. Here we find an elite, but as you can see, it's just no match for the lantern, because the souls that you can unleash from it just does so much damage. And at one point, I thought it bypassed the boss damage cap in the game, since there is a cap on how much you can damage bosses, since if you just have like infinite DPS, you can clear out bosses in like 2 seconds, and that was like a way to prevent it. So we're almost up to 500 subscribers by the time I record the commentary for this video, so it's been very very astonishing how much I'm able to grow just in the past month because I did start this channel in late December last year. So being able to grow this much is just astonishing. I never expected to get this far honestly. I expected like 100 views on every video and it's all possible because of you guys which is phenomenal. So again, I'm just trying to showcase as much as the projectiles from the lantern as possible. It's able to wipe out basically anything that comes into its range. And like I said before, I think taking the ammo mutation is very very crucial if you're going to run the lantern, since you definitely want to get more souls so you can unleash that attack more often. And also, I've gotten some comments saying that a lot of my viewers are actually around 20 years of age, so you are very very similar to mine. I'm, I am 20 years old right now and just in my third year of college, so 
it's good to know that, that a lot of my viewers are kind of in the same position as me. So moving onwards to the caverns because I wanted to fight the giant since I also did some just did some predictions in my head while I was running through the slumbering sanctuary because I wanted to kind of predict which boss will be best suited for the lantern build. So definitely not timekeeper because she moves all over the place and it's really hard to pull off the full combo of the lantern. Um, the other choice was Scarecrow, but again, Scarecrow moves all over the place. It's really hard to get get it to stay still, so I can so I can gather more souls. The only boss that I can see how the Lantern can potentially work out in is the Giant fight, since you actually can hit the fists even if you're standing on the ground with the Lantern's melee attack. And between these three bosses, Giant is the most suited for builds that have a slow setup. So because I want to get in as many hits as possible with my melee attack so that I can gather souls so that I can unleash the more powerful souls attack, I decided to go for giant. So here I just angered an elite oven knight but I didn't know where it was coming from so I just kind of ignored it. Um, the thing with the ground shakers, also the giant bears, is that they are very very weak to the lantern. So just like the golems, you can one-shot the ground shakers if you hit them with the projectiles from the lantern. However, you cannot hit them while you're facing their backside because their backside is protected. And any attacks to their backside will not do damage. So also with the slammers, I'm also trying to use the turrets, also trying to reduce the amount that I have to contact them. Since they are one of the most annoying enemies to deal with. And what you saw there was something I like to call air queuing. And it's something that I will make a tutorial on sometime in the future. Basically the concept of air queuing is like you hold the attack button while you're falling in the air. So that as soon as you hit the ground you will unleash whatever attack it is that you are trying to unleash while you're still in the air. So this is best suited if you have a slow weapon such as like symmetrical lance or broadsword or like flint but sometimes you are allowed to get creative with some of the attacks so there is a weapon in the game called the nerves of steel i'm not sure who has used it but basically what you do with, with that weapon is that you hold down the attack button and after like a second the bow will like glow and it will create a sound effect and if you release the attack button while it's glowing then you then you get in a critical hit with the nerves of steel so something that I've learned with that weapon is that you can hold down the attack button while you're falling in mid-air. And if you can get in the critical hit as soon as you hit the ground, you can like unleash it immediately. Which is something that takes a lot of practice of getting used to. This is also the case with the lantern because the lantern with the... If you charge up the souls, it actually... There is a small time where you are temporarily vulnerable to attacks. So what you can do now is charge up the attack while you're falling in mid-air. And here I took the ice armor and you might think this is a very awkward decision since the ice armor is a green item and I'm on brutality but I've actually seen a lot of players do this. So ice armor is one of those items where it's possible to just take it off color since you're just using it for its ability. What Ice Armor is able to do is negate the next instance of damage that you take. So if used strategically like what I did with the demons, you can essentially protect yourself from hits. So one thing I noticed about is that there is a separate door that I've never seen in the caverns before. And based on what I've seen, it looks like it actually leads to the Scarecrow, which is something that I did not know. So moving onwards to the giant. You just saw briefly on how I was able to defend myself from the fist attack while it was coming down because I had ice armor activated. So ice armor in my skills tier list, I gave it an A tier. The reason for this is if you can use it strategically, you can potentially negate a lot of damage that's about to be dealt to you. And this takes a lot of knowledge from the player's part since I don't think it's an item that's suited for beginner players. Because you have to kind of know the ins and outs of every single attacks from every single enemy so you can accurately predict when you are about to take damage and when to activate the ice armor. 
And you'll see time and time again how this is very helpful in this fight. So as you can see, as soon as I do the lantern, as soon as I unleash the souls from my lantern, it just does so much damage to the giant. And because I'm able to pull off the full combo with the lantern, I'm actually able to like, I'm actually able to get more souls so I can keep doing the combo. So we beat the giant, that was a no hit, and move on forwards to fight Hand of the King. I just skipped Hypey Castle because I didn't feel like it, and I wouldn't have had enough scroll fragments to get another scroll anyways. So how scroll fragments work is that if you get 4 of them, then you can get in another scroll stat. But the thing is, in both Distillery and the... So as you can see, I used Ice Armor as soon as I predicted I was able to get hit, and that's how I was able to negate that instance of damage by Hand of the King. So really, you'll see time and time again how the Ice Armor is extremely helpful. And like I said before, it is not a weapon that's accessible to newer players because I don't think a lot of people know how to use it. If you look at a lot of 5 DC players, some of them actually run Ice Armor as like in a tactics build because again, it protects them from a single instance of damage. But sometimes that single instance of damage could be the difference between life and death, so... Now something that I've saw, so there it is again with the ice armor, I predicted I was going to get hit, that's how I activated at the last second and I was able to negate that instance of damage. So something I saw with the lantern is that it's kind of bad against Hand the King considering that he can like block projectiles, however that's not really a problem and I didn't really have an issue getting, the, getting my attacks in since I always managed to unleash my soul's attack while he's performing some other attack, so he's not blocking the projectiles. So unfortunately, lost the no-hit, but overall not a bad fight, and I was able to move on forwards to the Astrolab. So the main problem with the Lantern, I feel, is it's just kind of slow to use. I think this weapon is better if it's dual scaled with Brutality and Survival and not Tactics, because I find this weapon to be extremely weird to use if you run it in Tactics. Since melee tactics just really isn't viable right now, you can do it, it's just very weird. I don't know what the devs are trying to go for, but this is the first two-handed item in the game that scales with brutality, so I guess that's something. Thing about tactics is that you don't want to use bad items, since there are so many good items available to tactics that you just don't want to use something like the repeated crossbow. I mean, yeah, it could work in tactics, like, a lot of the crossbows could work in tactics, it's just that it's very awkward to use because you're committing a lot of your time and energy just using exclusively those two items, since if you get a two-handed item, you cannot pick up anything else. So that kind of restricts, like, build choice, since you are restricted of what you can use, and this is one of the reasons why I don't really like two-handed weapons in general. Like, the only weapon that I actually thoroughly enjoy using are the Scythe Claws, since I think it provides enough of a distinction from the other items to really make it stand out, and it does so much damage as well. And one of the reasons why I also put Scythe Claws on the S tier in my 2.1 tier list is because you can now combo it with a shield inside your backpack, so you have way more defensive capabilities than before. Which, it was already a pretty good item before, now it's phenomenal. So moving onwards to the tower area, I found a piece of food but I'm going to leave it since I wanted to get the maximum use out of it in case I get hit again and since I'm above 50% health right now, I would have wasted a small portion of the healing provided by the food. I mean in Astrolab in general, anything can go wrong. And here I just noticed it now but I took armadillo pack sometime so I can take advantage of having a shield inside my backpack because I think it just makes the game a lot easier. I mean, there is no rule saying that you cannot run off-color items. 
So when we say that the color is off color, that means it does not align with the color that you're running in the current build. But I think running things off color is definitely in a thing that more experienced players will experiment with since I don't think a lot of newer players like to like around 2BC will ever think that running an off-color item is a good idea since it, you don't get any benefits from running that color, if that makes sense. So I couldn't get the Librarian, so what I'm just gonna do is do the cheese where you keep running into a wall and the Librarian just kind of like dies. It is kind of cheating, but I mean, it is something that they never bothered to fix, so, so might as well take advantage of it. I'm gonna get the food heal back up to almost 100% health, and go on forwards to fight the Collector. Now in this fight, I got rid of ammo because I don't think how I can ever unleash that many souls onto the Collector, and this fight is definitely going to be a bit tricky. So I watched Doc Firebird's showcase run of the Lantern, and in that video he unfortunately died to the Collector. So I'm going to finish this run for Doc, because it's only right that the Ferryman's Lantern gets the recognition that it deserves. So here we go, on to the Collector's boss fight. And spoiler alert, but this boss fight is going to drag on for a pretty long time. So how you can evaluate whether a weapon is good or not is judging how long this fight goes with the Collector. So, I said this in the last video, but if the Collector ever teleports you to a room where there's a spike ball flying around, that, that means your build is not as good as it seems, since if you have a very good build, you will not get teleported to that room because he will just never have enough time to where he reaches that stage. Now, as you can see here, something really curious about the Lantern is that I'm actually able to gain souls from the Collector even though I wasn't able to damage him. So what you saw there, I just kind of used the melee attack to hit the Collector even though he is shielded. And although I did no damage in that time frame, I was still able to get more souls for the Lantern. So here we go, entering the room with the spike, with the spike ball. So this is how you can tell your, your build just quite isn't good enough. So what I think about the Lantern, I don't think it's S tier. I don't think it will ever be S tier. But this fight just kept on dragging on for so long. And finally got the Collector down to his third and final heal, just trying to get in as much damage as possible since the longer you stay in a boss fight, the more chances of something going wrong. And here, as soon as he does the Meteor attack, I will use Ice Armor, because that's when I suspect something will go wrong. And here you kind of see how much of a drag this fight has been. I mean, the Lantern does a lot of damage, but when it comes to the Collector, a lot of damage just isn't quite good enough. Like, you need something extremely special in order to easily beat this boss. And also, I'm not used to playing without a shield. I usually play with shields because I think it makes me a lot more confident at the game. But, it, I mean, it's still doable without a shield. I contemplated about removing Armadillo Pack since I don't see how I'm able to perform a lot of parries with just a shield in my backpack. But fortunately, I'm able to get the Panacea, and I'm finally able to bring this fight to a close. So I gotta finish this one for Doc, you know, and show everyone that you can actually win runs with the Lantern. So there is the run, Collector is down. So this has been a run featuring the Ferryman's Lantern. Hopefully you have enjoyed it, and with this last couple of minutes, I wanted to share my thoughts about this weapon in general. So I think the Ferryman's Lantern is an adequate item. 
but if I were to put it somewhere on my tier list, I would probably say B tier or C tier. Now the reason for this is, again like what I said about two-handed weapons, is that they restrict your playstyle since you are stuck with these two items no matter what. You cannot switch things up and one of the few ways that you can kind of mitigate this is use the backpack mutations. So with every single two-handed item, I feel that a lot of that desperately need something defensive and I think the backpack has what it takes. The only problem is that the lantern dual scales with brutality and tactics. So you're not able to get the advantages of using a shield. So that's why I ran off-color armadillo pack since I think Again, two-handed items, you just need a bit of defense capabilities, otherwise I don't think it's gonna work out. So overall, I think the Lanterns is fine, you should definitely try it out, and it is a pretty difficult item to win with. I did have to make a bunch of really interesting decisions, including taking the Ice Armor, which is not something that I do very often. But this has also kind of been my pitch on saying how the Ice Armor is better than it looks, since as you saw numerous times, the Ice Armor was able to prevent a lot of hits for me because I knew I could not get out of the way before the enemy unleashed an attack, so that's why I put up the Ice Armor just in time so that I can negate some damage. So hopefully I've convinced you that the Ice Armor is deserving of its A tier on my skills tier list, as well as the averageness of the Lantern because I think it's just a pretty average item in general. So that's gonna do it for this video. Hopefully I will have the Snake Fang video sometime out in the future. So until then, thanks for watching.